even though it's been a year. Um, so um, this, I'm going to give a talk, and the talk is on the fourth precept. Um, so it's a list of ethics in Buddhism, um, and it was entitled Authentic Speech, I believe. So um, there's a few, maybe, shall we say, disclosures or even confessions I need to make before we start. So I have written lots of notes and I've prepared. Um, for me, authenticity is very much about being present yeah, and being engaged with you as I am right now. So if I'd written a paper and I sat here and read it out to you, which was one of the things, given how many ideas I've had, it would have been very tempting to just write a paper. I don't think that would have been very authentic. So in a certain kind of way, we're already into the difficulties around speech. Yeah. There is more to being truthful than just being honest yeah. or just being factually accurate. Yeah. There's something else, there's a quality sometimes in speech that we're looking for. Yeah. Um, and so to declare some of my biases, I'm also a psychotherapist as well as a practicing Buddhist, and I'm interested in myth and archetype. Yeah. So one of the figures that has been on my mind or was in my heart or in my experience quite recently is a goddess who's called Aphrodite or maybe better known to some of you as Venus, the goddess of love. And um, that might seem a surprising image to bring into a Buddhist context. Um, it might seem an even more surprising image to bring into a conversation about speech and truth. Um, bear with me. Um, even though it seems strange, it might just be a way of me sort of rambling around and orientating and collecting my thoughts. Yeah, it might just be something that I'm doing as a way of helping me make sense of something. And I'm just trying to share some of that process with you. It's an example of how I, I play with images and stories and myths that have moved me and help me make connections. Make, yeah. Um, so to put this in the landscape of what we've been doing here at North London Buddhist Centre. So um, once a month, somebody gives a talk. And at the moment, we're working our way through a series called um, Buddhist Ethics. Yeah? And there's a list um, of five precepts or training principles. Yeah? So the idea is behind this is that these five types of behaviour that are being suggested as training principle, they are the ways in which a Buddha wants, would spontaneously behave. Yeah? If you met somebody who was enlightened, they'd do this just because there's a natural expression of who they were as a person. Yeah. So we've already explored three of those. Yeah. Um, uh, practicing acts of loving kindness and abstaining from acts of violence and killing. Yeah. The second precept is to practice generosity and to abstain from taking the not given or stealing. Yeah. The third precept that was explored was around practicing simplicity, stillness and contentment and abstaining from sexual misconduct. Um, so we're on the fourth precept, um, truthful speech, abstaining from falsehoods. Yeah. Um, this is all in the context of ethics, and Sangha Ashta teaches ethics as a difference between acting from something that we could call the love mode, as opposed to acting from a place that we could call the power mode. Yeah. So these are act these, the reason that we're practicing these things is we were attempting to become more loving. Yeah. And we're also attempting to let go of power, but we're talking about power in a very particular way. We're talking about power over other people. So what we're looking for, very simply, I would describe it as we're looking for ways to stop trying to control other people's behavior. Yeah. That's usually what power is, abuses of power are around trying to control someone else's behavior and make them do something they wouldn't do otherwise. Yeah. Whereas actually if we're inviting somebody to behave in a certain way, responding to somebody from a place of love, well, I'm interested in who you are and how you are. Yeah, I don't actually want you to be someone else. I want to find out who you are. Yeah. So I think that's kind of very simple, basic kind of orientating principle for me around ethics. It's like, um, because we might sometimes use to power with others. We might collaborate, we might cooperate. There are things that we can do and get done. There are pieces of work we can achieve that we can't do on our own. And therefore we do need power with others in a way that's honest and authentic. Yeah? The problem around power is when we use it to try and manipulate, control, or oppress other people. Um, a small note just to possibly confuse things. Um, there is another list of ethics that we use in Tree Ratma called the 10 principles, you know, 10 pillars of Buddhism is a, a book that I've been referring to and reading quite recently. Um, 
This is Sangharachita expanding all mythics around a list of 10. Now in that list of 10, um, he points out something fairly obvious that in that list, there are three um, sets of ethics around how we use our body. Yeah, I've already mentioned they're the first three and that was the same in both lists. Um, there are in the 10 principles or 10 ethics, um, there are four around speech and there are another three around the mind. You know, in, now in that condensed version of the five, um, we've got the one speech precept and one on mind. Yeah, But I think somehow the expanded list gives us a sense of how much is going on when we use our, our voice, when we use speech, and also how much is going on when we use our minds. Yeah? Um, and I am going to touch on all four of the speech precepts. And I'm going to keep coming back to the focus, which is around being honest, about being authentic. So um, I think Aphrodite's waited long enough before I've actually said who she is and what she's about. Yeah, so um, the connection for us as Buddhists might be, although it might seem a bit tenuous for some, um, on the night the Buddha that gained enlightenment, yeah, it was a full moon night. Yeah. Well, there was also some other detail as well. So after he'd gained enlightenment and sat all night, um, the first thing he saw in the morning sky was the morning star. Yeah which is a reference to the planet Venus, yeah, which is unusual because in the Pali Canon, you know, that's an oral tradition. Um, there's a certain economy of words, you know, things, I think things are included for a reason. And it's quite struck me that actually she's been given a place there, somehow sort of something that the transition from what happened after the enlightenment, something else. Um, and when I think of Aphrodite, um, I think of her pleasure, her beauty, um, and something that's very Buddhist is that actually most people who worship or engage with Aphrodite recognize that she's very much into change and impermanence. It might seem a strange thing to point out, uh, but a mentor of mine called Manjushra, he had this really curious, really ordinary story where if you've ever been on retreat, um, one of the few treats is dessert. Yes. So if somebody serves dessert, which might happen once, maybe twice on a retreat, people get very excited, yeah? Um, and on one time, they were, they were, somebody pointed out that the second bowl of ice cream never tastes as good as the first bowl. Because yeah. if you're very excited about dessert, you might go back for a second bowl full. But there's something curious about that, is if we go back to the experience, hoping it's going to be just as pleasurable, just as beautiful as it was the first time, well, somehow it doesn't quite work. Yeah, there's something about sort of allowing the impermanence, the changeability of it. It's something about the newness, the novelty, the fact that actually the reality is every time we have an experience, it's completely new. Even if we're expecting or hoping for something familiar, it always changes. So beauty and pleasure are very much connected with embracing changeability. Um, I also think that Aphrodite points to the same problem that Buddhists are grappling with, yeah? um, desire. Yeah? We're told in Buddhism that actually something, something might be difficult about life. Suffering might arise because of my desires. Yes. Um, I don't know if Aphrodite is terribly interested in helping us solve that problem. <laughs> I think her approach is coming from a different angle, but nevertheless, um, there is something about the realm of Aphrodite. There's no kidding ourselves. I want what I want. Yeah, my desires, my lusts, my longings, my yearnings, they are what they are. Yeah. And there's a very real problem there about, well, how am I going to live with that? You know, if we're putting that in a Buddhist context, it's like, well, how do I actually live with that honestly? Because there's not a lot of point pretending, you know, that I'm enjoying something when I'm not. There's not a lot of point in pretending that something's beautiful if I don't experience it as a beautiful. I might be willing to experiment, I might be willing to sort of explore in that direction, but my response is what it is. Okay. Um, So authenticness as honesty is authentic seems to have etymological origins with 
words like origin and source. Yeah. So when we talk about somebody being authentic, what we're usually recognizing is a sense that somehow there's an originality about the person. Yeah. That this is some kind of quite often we notice their vulnerability. There's a sense of their kind of all their imperfections. Um, and it gives us a quality of aliveness in the relationship in the person. I often find that when I'm speaking to someone who's authentic, or if I have moments of feeling more authentic myself, there's a sense of, oh gosh, I've shown something of myself. Yeah. Um, and there's usually a little bit of an edge there. Yeah. So maybe I've given away more than I meant to. Maybe I said or showed more of myself more than I meant to. Yeah. So there's a particular kind of honesty that we're inviting here. Um, Sangharashtra talks about this um, as a vital mutual responsiveness. And he talks about the communication that goes on in the spiritual community. There is a sense of something vital or alive, something mutually responsive. I think when I think of things that are vital, they're not controllable. You can't pin them down. You know, if it's too planned, if it's too packaged, yeah, it's you know, something a bit plastic, something not quite real about it. So this phrase, we're always giving ourselves away. So the first time I heard that was somebody talking about um, a job that I used to do. So I used to work for the Karen Trust, which is a charity based upstairs, and they do door to door fundraising. So we'd go around and knock on people's doors. And we'd say to them, hello, you know, this is a charity, we're doing some work in India, we're trying to raise some money for people who are at the ex untouchables, the Dalits in India. And you would find out very, very quickly whether or not somebody wanted to have a conversation with you or not. Yeah. And one of the trainers, one of the mentors said is, well, yes, because every time you open your mouth, whatever you're saying, you're giving yourself away. It's quite an extraordinary idea. It's like whenever I say anything, whenever I present myself to anyone, you know, whether I'm aware of it or not, you know, I'm giving an awful lot of information about who I am, how I am right now. You know, do I actually, I, I think door knocking is a fantastic example of a time when we might be knocking on someone's door and saying, hey, do you want to talk to me? I might not be wanting to talk to them because I might be absolutely terrified. Yes. So there's something about how often when we're approaching people in conversation, we're giving off signals about, am I really open to a conversation? Am I really interested in you right now? What am I here for? In that example, it's a very good example of, do I have an agenda? Is there something I want to get out of this conversation? Or am I just interested in meeting you and finding out who you are? I think these are things that are going on all the time whenever we talk to people. So one of the associations that comes up for me around that is it's almost like when we talk to people, it's a confession, maybe an unconscious confession, but we're giving ourselves away all the time. And this sense of in some drawing in some other elements is um, this color that I'm wearing blue, yes, is associated with Aphrodite. It's also associated with the throat chakra which is sometimes referred to in Pali or Hindi as Vashuddhi, which translates to purity. Yeah? There's something about the purification, purity of our speech. Um, so in a Buddhist context, you might well be thinking about confession around ethics. Yeah? If I'm going to learn about myself and learn more about myself in behavior, yeah, is am I willing to talk about my behavior? Am I willing to talk about my behavior in relationship to a set of values, to a set of ethics? Yes. So um, for people who choose to uh, pursue ordination or eventually get ordained, there is an opportunity to gather possibly once a week and share with a group of people breaches of the precepts, you know, where you can talk about your behavior in relationship to your values and to your ethics. Um, it's a very particular thing that I don't know how often we do. Yeah, it could be very ordinary. And I think we're moving into the interesting times where we might find that actually a lot more of are doing are doing this work more regularly for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, as a, as a species globally, we're being invited to reflect very deeply at the moment on a set of ethics and principles, particularly what I see coming into the foreground is concerns around the environment and the climate crisis. There's also the area of race and race relations and what that means and racial diversity and inclusion. 
Um, there is also the area around gender and sexual relationship diversity. You know, some people's right to define themselves and state themselves for themselves in relationship with others in community. There seems to be this huge eruption going on, yes, whether you're Buddhist or not. You know, we're being invited to a conversation where it's like, well, where am I in this conversation? And where are my values and ethics in this conversation? And am I willing to change my behavior? Because that seems to be an awful lot of what these three different conversations are inviting us to at least consider. So we're being invited to a conversation. Um, slowing down a bit here. Yeah, I think I want to keep this relatively simple. Um, what I want to say is around the ordinariness of this. I'd, I'd like to make a distinction here about confession, apology, and amends. You know, these are three aspects of what goes on, because I think sometimes we can try and do, in my experience, I have done this and I have been on the receiving end of this, where somebody's tried to do all three of these things at the same time. And I'm just going to suggest that they're actually separate conversations. Yeah. Um, so confession is probably the conversation that needs to happen first. It might be a conversation I happen with, have with myself. It might be a conversation I have with a very good friend who shares the same values and ethics. It's very important. There's not a lot of point trying to have a confessional conversation with somebody who doesn't know where you're coming from or doesn't hold the same values and ethics. Yeah. And largely it's around just saying to someone and letting your words hit the air and just say, ouch or oops. I think I did something that really doesn't sit well with me right now. And that's usually the first thing to say is just describe what happened, what I said, what I didn't say, what I did or what I didn't do, and how that's left me. Yeah. And if I can get a bit of clarity about well, what value or what ethic is it that feels like it doesn't sit well around that. Yeah. Um, and it might just be the sense of actually, well, actually, I think I hurt that person or I think I hurt myself. I might not be able to get much further than that. But I might be able to say something like, well, I think I took something from them that they didn't want to give me. Yeah. I might be able to get a little bit clearer about an ethical value that really doesn't sit well for me and get clear about how I want to behave in future. Yeah. An apology is usually, I would suggest, is when we're ready to go to the person who's actually been hurt or harmed. Yeah. Um, very simply just getting in the habit of saying sorry to people. You know, actually, if I need to say sorry to someone, it's just going to them and saying, I'm really sorry I did that. I think I hurt you. Yeah. Um, one thing is that you might find out that the other person wasn't hurt, which could be really interesting feedback. Yeah. The other one is actually, you might be saying something to someone, actually, you might be the only person who's ever apologized to them for that happening to them. That can be hugely significant. I can't, can't overstate how important it is apologizing to people. People go through life experiencing all sorts of harms that nobody ever apologizes for. It might be very rare. It might even have been the first time that somebody's actually taken the trouble to say, hang on, I thought about what happened and I need to say sorry for that. Um, the other thing I would say is allow some time. Don't apologize too soon. If someone's feeling hurt and angry and you try and apologize too soon, you know, in certain situations at certain times, that can be a way of sort of signaling, I really want you to stop being angry with me. I really want you to stop being hurt about this. They might not be ready yet. Yeah, who's this apology for? Yeah, because actually if it's for them, it's like, well, when do they want to hear it? Now, amends is a curious one. I, I think men's, you could almost do a whole talk on making amends. I think it's a huge area, yeah. Um, making amends, I, it might mean that to the person that you've harmed, you can do something that makes up for, or at least goes to some way of making up for the harm, yeah. Um, it brings up really interesting questions about, well, what can I do? It brings up just the limits of being a human being. 
I can think of certain things that I've said over time where actually I've been very hurtful to someone and actually there is a real limit to how much I can make up for that. You know, I might be able to acknowledge how much I've hurt somebody, but I might not be able to repair the, might not be able to repair the friendship. You know, some things are that damaging and it's like, well, actually, what can I do about this? Maybe all I can do is be honest and walk away. Yeah. Um, it doesn't always have to be to the person we've hurt. The amends could be something more creative. And I think this is an area where, for instance, where we might actually go and do something for a group of people, like a charitable act, whether it's giving money or actually getting involved in something where we feel like, well, actually, I might not be able to help that individual in the way I want to, but I can go and put my energy in this direction. Yeah. Um, it might just even seemingly be something indirect, you know, just by doing some charitable work, by some kind of putting some energy back into the world in a way that feels generous, that may be a way of sort of indirectly, but balancing something out, you know, giving something back as a symbol of, this is me making amends, doing some good in the world. Okay. I want to move on. Like I say, there's so much more I could say about these things, but I'm aware of time. Um, and this is supposed to be a talk about truthful speech. <laughs> so, um, right. So, in terms of truthful speech, um, the obvious things to say about the truth is that um, we just take the trouble to be factually accurate. I don't something my mind's blown already because of course we live in a world where actually it's we're talking about it very openly the reality of fake news disinformation um misrepresentation um we now live in a world where we're being told that this is ordinary and normal you know that if you read something on social media um you need to fact check it you can't just assume that it's true which is mind-boggling in itself because it's like, if I'm being told that, it's like, well, where do I go? Where do I go for sources of information that seem trustworthy? Um, it's a phenomenal amount of work. That's the obvious thing that I want to say. It's a phenomenal amount of work now, trying to make sense of what's going on for us as a community, for us as a species even, about what's going on. Um, Again, it's a vast topic that I could say an awful lot about. Yeah. The thing that occurred to me and has been going on for a lot for me with friends and with family recently, um, one of the things I've needed to grapple with is actually, it's very unlikely that the person who I'm talking to, yeah, usually a family member or a friend, it's not that they're telling me a lie or telling me something that's false. What's going on is they've read something, they've heard something, they've seen something. Yeah. And they want to explore that. And quite often they're coming from a very honest, genuine, authentic place. They've heard something, it's impacted them and they've taken a position, maybe they do or don't want to talk about it, but somehow we've found ourselves in a conversation. Yeah. I'm not talking to somebody who's actually telling lies or telling falsehoods. Who I'm talking to is somebody who has actually read something and believed it, listened to something and believed it. And now we're having a disagreement. Yeah. And somewhere in the mix is the idea that somebody could have lied about this. Somebody could have said something that's false, which is something they could say to me. It's like, well, how can I trust where you've got your information from? How can I trust what you think and believe about all of this? It's just exhausting. It's just exhausting. And I think there's something in there for us around how to have honest, authentic conversations when what could be at stake is, well, where's the information come from and how do we check that? Yeah. What I didn't really encourage people to do in terms of being truthful and being honest is really slow the conversation down. If you hear somebody say something that seems hurtful or offensive or ill-informed or misrepresentative, it's like, well, maybe there is a piece of work to be done first. It's like, well, where did they get that information from? And what are they saying it for? Yeah. Which can be very difficult, you know, because I identify as a gay man, yeah. Um, cis male. Um, nevertheless, I can be involved in conversations that I find personally very hurtful and upsetting. Yeah? And at the same time, there is a sense of can I slow down and actually kind of think, well, where's that information come from? Yeah? 
because I also know that like, it's taken me a long time to research and find out information, actually find out accurately some of the issues that are going on in that community that I identify very strongly with. I know I am really struggling still to get trans um, sexuality right and pronouns. I still stumble over pronouns. Yeah. Um, and I don't always understand. Yeah, I haven't fully digested some of the information. So I'm regularly engaging in conversations where actually it's like, well, okay, I'm getting it wrong. How am I getting it wrong? In what way? What's the information? Um, and I might be talking to someone who doesn't actually, as very familiar, I would imagine to a lot of us now, somebody might say, I don't want to educate you. Well, then where do I go to get my information? Yeah. Um, it's just a lot of work. That's what keeps coming back for me. And I think there's something about us individually and collectively reeling from realizing how much work it's going to be, to be honest, as we move forward, whatever our position, however we locate ourselves in this conversation, this is going to be a lot of work. Yeah. And what I want us to encourage, that's why I started off with confession, apology and amends is, I really want us to have a lot of permission to make mistakes and get it wrong. Yeah, because I think that's going to become something that ideally becomes very ordinary and everyday. Because as soon as we can get beyond the point of feeling like I've got to get it right all the time, first time, yeah, we can start to have these conversations more honestly and actually find out from each other kindly and with interest, where might this conversation take us? Yeah, how comes it's important for me as well as for you to be talking about this right now? So there are two. Yes. So a quote from the Buddha. It's a good idea to quote him directly, given it's a Buddhist Dharma talk at some point. So this is from the Dharmapada. There is no evil that cannot be done by a lying person who has transgressed one precept and who holds in contempt the world beyond probably blunt and direct, isn't it? So was going, there is no evil that cannot be done by a lying person who has transgressed one precept and who holds in contempt the world beyond. Um, thankfully, I don't think we meet many people who are actually like that. I think that's a very rare state of affairs for somebody to be so vehemently lying to us. Yeah. Um, I think it places the point of truth very much in this context of actually about behavior. Right? Being truthful is about being honest about the things that I have done, haven't done, have said and haven't said. Yeah. And it also puts us in the world beyond, in other words, consequences. Yeah. That actually in these conversations about being truthful, quite often what's being avoided is consequences. Yeah. If I'm really truthful, what might the consequence be of that? If I really talk about this in detail, if I'm really honest about how this has been for me, what I've said, what I've done, yeah, what might that bring up in the conversation? How might that be transformed? This is essentially an act of love. Yeah. Very easily, we could get into the territory of judgments and shaming, yeah? criticizing ourselves, criticizing others. Yeah. Maybe you noticed a little bit of tightness there as I was talking about this. Notice how it shifts. So I invite you to think that this is possibly a conversation that is inviting love, inviting a deeper love. Yeah. What if in sharing for a deeply honest place, because I'm concerned about how my behaviors are impacting you and me. If that was an expression of love, and that if I could trust that in myself, and if I could trust that in you, how might that transform the conversation that we could be about to have? What if the world beyond is a beyond where actually where actually I could really listen to you, find out how to yeah, be more kind. To really hear about what would suit you better. Yeah, what would support us in relationship with each other. 
that's a very different conversation to just turn around and saying to someone, I think you're wrong. Okay. So um, this is a quote from Sangharachita, um, and this is from his book, The Ten Pillars of Buddhism. So um, a thought occurred to him while he was writing this paper, when he was talking about truth. When we speak the truth, we do, of course, expect to be believed, since otherwise no communication can take place. Similarly, we should believe others when they speak the truth. Next to killing a man or anyone, perhaps the worst possible thing you can do to them, and this is the point I want to make, is not to believe them when they are speaking the truth. Not to believe them when they are speaking the truth negates their identity as a social being and disrupts human solidarity. Such disbelief is in fact an act of violence. It is not enough, therefore, that we should speak the truth. We should also believe others when they speak it, especially within the spiritual community. This means that we shall have to develop sufficient awareness and sensitivity to tell when another person really is speaking the truth, since otherwise we may unintentionally do them a great wrong. It does create, well, it almost seemed prophetic when I read that two or three months ago, because it just seems to, in a nutshell, sum up for me what the problem is about the world we're living in in the moment, is I really want to believe you, and. And I think we're going to be having this conversation for a long time. So, um, very quickly took me into territory, it seems important to mention the other three of the four precepts because I think they do help us out around this conversation about how to be truthful and be honest yeah, in a more rounded way. Yeah. So um, the next speech precept is kindly speech, Yeah, to practice kindly speech and to abstain from harsh speech. Um, It's a very simple quote that um, I heard a while back that stayed with me. Um, and actually, if you Google Maya Angelou quotes, it's the one that comes up top. <laughs> so clearly, it's one of the favorite Maya Angelou quotes. Who is, if you don't know, is a black uh, female poet, um, American. And um, the quote goes, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did but people will never forget how you made them feel. I'll say that again. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. Um, so we recognize it, we don't, we recognize it when somebody's moving towards us with kindly speech. Yeah. I think Maya Angelou is nodding to lots of different possibilities from that statement, but I think certainly we can turn around that we know when somebody's been kind to us by their tone of voice and the, how they've approached us. Yeah. But there's also some practical things. It's like, I think kindly is, well, what does this other person want from this conversation? Yeah. When is a good time to talk to them? Yeah. And how, how is an important conversation? How do I want to bring this matter up? How do I want to talk about this? Um, the hows for me, there's a couple of things that um, maybe a little bit confessional here around. Um, I noticed that I can go into a sort of knowing position that I know what's going on and I know what's best. And there's a how in that, isn't there? It's like trying to be really open-ended that somebody else might take this conversation in a direction that I completely wasn't expecting. Yeah. So I know what I, how I want to start the conversation, but somebody else might want to talk about it in a completely different way. It might bring out all sorts of things for them that I wasn't expecting. I 
feel I'm noticing that I'm not having many concrete examples in the in, in what I'm sharing with you. It feels a little bit abstract, but at the same time, I'm not. Nothing's coming to mind, so I'm just going to move on with what I need to say and see if the examples come through towards the end. So the next uh, speech precept is around meaningful speech, which, if you familiar with what we call the sevenfold puja is sometimes translated as helpful speech, um, some, some timely, yes? So we practice meaningful speech and we try and abstain from fr frivolous speech. Um, it's interesting because frivolous, I also think of froth and foam and there is something about Aphrodite, she does like a bit of froth. Yes. Um, she also likes her bling, which is partly why I wore my ear stud today and a bit of jewellery. Um, there is something in there about the meaning behind sometimes, yeah, how we connect with someone. It's a bit of pleasure, a bit of froth, a bit of foam. It can sometimes be a way to actually get into connection with someone. Yes, if we're all heavy and dour and serious all of the time, then there's no pleasure, there's no beauty. Yeah. So again, there might be something a little bit more subtle or a little bit perhaps a bit more three-dimensional going on when we're talking about meaningful speech. And the example that came again, partly from when I was thinking back to working for Karen or knocking on doors. Um, if you're knocking on somebody's door and saying hello to them, they can open the door in all sorts of states of mind and being. Yes, anything from I'm in the middle of bathing the kids to kind of like, you know, I just got in and collapsed in front of the telly and actually I didn't want to talk to anyone this evening. What on earth are you doing standing on my doorstep? You know, through to somebody else being completely and utterly delighted and amazed that you've taken the trouble to come and knock on their door and say, there's this really amazing charity. Do you want to give us some money? Yeah. Um, the teaching around this was around meeting the other person's energy. Yeah. So the other person would come at you and you would read their body language and their tone of voice and instinctively you would try and mirror them. Yeah. Now obviously there's a way in doing this that could actually potentially be quite false. Yeah, kind of performative. Yeah. But what I notice quite often is actually if I really felt in my body, yeah, where the other person was coming from, how they were holding themselves, whether they were speaking from their heart or from their belly, or maybe sometimes when people are in a bit of a rush, maybe they're speaking from their legs. Yeah. You can really get a sense of where somebody's coming from. Yeah. So sometimes meaningful speech, I think, is when we meet somebody where they are. You know, somebody's really low energy and a bit depressed today. There's not a lot of point being all sparkly and shiny with them. Yeah. It doesn't mean you have to necessarily jump to the bottom of the well with them. Yeah. But you sort of take on a little bit of that energy and kind of find out, well, where is that in me? How can I meet them where they are? Yeah. In the same time, when someone's quite cross or angry about something, um, maybe you don't want to be cross and angry back, but you might need to be quite firm. You might need to be in your center. You might need to stand your ground, have your legs underneath you. You might even need to be quite fierce in your response rather than just sort of be knocked over and collapse. Yeah. So the meaning that's in the conversation and kind of really feeling a sense of like, well, how do I meet you in this? So that we actually meet each other so that we can actually have a conversation. Yeah. Again, trying to place it back in a context of how might this be a loving way to respond? Yeah. Because if I just bounce off you, or if we sort of pass through each other, yeah, we don't actually meet. And if I don't meet you, if I don't come into contact with you, well, then there's not a lot of love there. Yeah. There isn't a possibility for something to be loving. Um, I was going to save the story about Aphrodite towards the end. So she's going to get more of a talking about here. Um, she's going to be included. Um, one of the interesting things about how the stories about Aphrodite is how often conflict and argument comes up. Yeah. Um, in a way, there's at least one example. Yeah. Most people who've been in a romantic relationship know that if nothing else, even on a very really mild level, there are usually some disagreements that need discussing, if not outright arguments and conflict. Yeah. There is something about being in loving contact with someone. Yeah. Whereas actually, if you're going to do the work of finding out, well, who am I and who are you and who are we really? Yeah. There might be a bit of conflict, a bit of contact, a bit of kind of coming up against each other and even bouncing off of each other at times. Yeah? That in a way, if it's done honestly and lovingly, actually makes a more meaningful relationship. Yeah? Um, 
So that's connected with the fourth precept, I feel. So the, the way we talk about it is that harmonious speech, yeah? Moving towards and embracing harmonious speech, um, but also moving away from slanderous speech or divisive speech. Yeah, so harmony and is about being together and coming together in community. And the phrase that Sangharashti used, and I'm not gonna, I don't think I'm gonna quote him quite accurately here, but it's something along the lines of, better to have an honest collision than a dis dishonest collusion. Yes, there is a danger when we're harmonizing that we're sort of just going to being compliant and sort of floating alongside, when actually there's something that actually needs talking about. And actually there might be some honest collisions that need to take place before a genuine harmony can arise. Yes. And again, it's very much to do with our intention. Yes, it keeps coming back to this. It's, it'd be very easy to do that in a very judgmental way, in a very critical way. The invitation is, is to try and do that from a place of love. Yes, if I'm coming into collision with you, it's because actually I want to find out what's really going on here. I want to find out how to really get in communication with you. I want to find a way to be in a loving relationship with you rather than just avoid you or rather just sort of float along and pretend we agree when maybe we don't. Maybe we don't.